All right. Like I said, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Kyle Kite with Claus Financial. We've also got Nate Bribey here on the screen as well from Claus, and then we're happy to be joined by Pat Agnew today from Agnew Law Office. So we've done a lot of work with Pat over the years. He's one of our uh, Claus professional network um, attorneys on our website, so you can always look for his um, info on there. Um, as I mentioned before, we will do some live Q&A at the end for anybody that has questions and wants to wait to ask it live to Pat. Um, but if you come up with something throughout the presentation, there is a Q&A box down at the bottom. There's also a chat box. We'll continue monitoring those throughout the presentation. Um, and there's also a raise hand if you want to push that. And then we'll, uh, like I said, keep an eye on that as well. So. Like I said, thank you everybody for joining us again. And I'll turn it over to Nate here to give you a little info about Claus Financial for those of you that don't work with us on a regular basis. Yep, thanks Kyle. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Nate Bribey with Claus Financial. I'm an advisor down in our Illinois office here in Rockford. Um, Claus Financial, we were uh, founded in 1976. So we've been in business now for 47 years. We are what you call a fee-only uh, registered investment advisor, uh, financial planning focused firm. So being a registered investment advisor, that's a fancy way to say we are a fiduciary, which is a word that Pat, Pat likes, that it means that we have to act in our, our client's best interest when we're rendering advice. So we definitely like to point that out for those of you that are not clients and are just interested in learning more about our firm. So um, being a financial planning focused firm, we go through the six steps of the financial planning process, talking about tax planning, retirement planning, investments, and insurance. And one of the um, parts of the process that comes up is estate planning. And that's why we have Pat here, because Kyle and I, nor any advisors at uh, Kloss Financial, are attorneys. So that's where we like to have great local attorneys like Pat um, on speed dial to send our clients to for help creating their estate plans and monitoring them. So we are happy to have Pat today. He's going to run down some um, basics of estate planning and um, please think of some questions. And um, I know I will certainly have some as we go, but um, Pat, I guess the floor is yours and let's um, let's uh, learn what we need to know about estate planning. So what <clears throat> Nate meant to say was easy questions, first of all. <laughs> Don't stump them on right day. out of the gate. No one have to think hard. So that would be and I, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, but yeah, Nate and I go to the same barber just <laughs> <don't know> what <laughs> happened. <laughs> Very low cost. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and built for speed. So, you know, no resistance. Um, let me go ahead and change the screen. Uh, so you have to look at my face the whole time here. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I'm pretty flexible here. I mean, if if you use your chat or your question key and, and give Kyle or Nate some specific areas you want to hear about or things you're expecting to, by all means, do that. Um, I'm, you know, I, I want to provide information that you want to hear. So my thought is kind of starting at, at really kind of a, a pretty high level zone and, 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 you know, general estate planning and kind of whittle down a little bit. Um, so please, you know, as I'm going along, if you have questions or an area that I, I didn't cover well or you'd like me to cover, just just go for it. Um, if I don't know the answer, I'll just start making stuff up. So, you know, no one will even know the difference. So we'll we'll be good. Um, so, you know, I think when you look at estate planning in general, um, you know, when a person dies and they have all their assets up here, you know, the, the, the question is really just kind of about, okay, well, how do these assets work their way down to whoever the beneficiaries are? That, that's really what this whole process is when somebody dies. Um, and for the most part, with all the complexity and stuff we have out there, there's there's really kind of four ways that it, that it has to happen. I mean, every asset is going to have to flow through one of these ways. Um, you know, probably the most common thing is when you have retirement accounts and life insurance when you set those type of assets up, they ask you, hey, when you die, who should we give this money to? So you designate a beneficiary ahead of time. And then upon your death, they just direct the money right to the beneficiary of name. So you've kind of set up an estate plan for that asset on your own just by designating the beneficiary. No court, no probate, no will, just right to the beneficiary. The obvious key there is you have to have a beneficiary named. Um, 
common mistake here. Well, I set this IRA up. Who do you want as beneficiary? Oh, I want my spouse to be the beneficiary. Great. Off they go. But I never set up a contingent or a secondary beneficiary. My spouse and I die in a common car accident. And now all of a sudden, there's no beneficiary. And so my kids are there going, hey, didn't he name us as a beneficiary? Oh, I, I guess he must have forgot to do that. So a beneficiary is a nice way of having things pass, but you got to you gotta make sure that you have not only a primary, but at least a secondary beneficiary and two just as a contingency plan. Um, another pretty commonly owned way, you know, husband and wife, uh, we own this savings account or checking account together. We are joint tenants on the checking account. And when it's jointly owned, that says, well, if one of us dies, the surviving tenant automatically becomes the owner. So that asset flows right to the surviving owner. Or if I have my child on the account with me, it passes to them. Um, so that that's a pretty common uh, way as well, especially with spouses. Um, you know, most of their assets on the first death, the house, the cars, the bank accounts, you know, they're, they're all held jointly. And so at the first death, that all goes to the surviving spouse. And there really isn't a lot of estate administration when one spouse dies in a couple. Uh, so those are the two ways that assets will flow without any kind of real legal action, okay? But other than that, it's gonna come down to two things. Uh, so if I have an asset that I don't have a beneficiary on, um, I'm not jointly owned, but I've created a, a, a trust, a revocable trust, and I place that asset in my trust while I'm alive. Uh, the nice thing about trusts is that they say when the creator of the trust dies, any assets that are sitting in that trust will be distributed directly to the beneficiaries that, that the person creating the trust outlined. No probate, no court, just goes right to that beneficiary. So um, again, the key there is I have to have the asset in the in the trust, but then upon my death, I get to designate who I want to be in charge, the trustee, and under the terms of the trust, they will be able to instantly step up and start delivering assets to the beneficiaries that I named in my trust. So that, that can be a pretty easy process when you have a trust and, and we've placed the assets in the trust which leads to the last way that assets pass. And for most people, this is the least desirable. So I have an asset that's in my name. I haven't designated a beneficiary. I don't have a joint owner on it with me and I don't have a trust. So I've got the checking account, it's in my name, no beneficiary, it's just my asset and I die. Who gets it? Well. It's either gonna be one of two things. Maybe I had a will in which I put instructions that said, this is the person who I'd like to receive that. Or maybe I don't have anything. I didn't even have a will, which legally they say, then you've died intestate, which I guess is probably Latin for dies without a will, but I've never looked that up. But in my mind, that's, that's what that means. Um, and in that case, the Illinois Probate Act um, will tell us who gets your assets. But in either one of those, whether you have a will or don't have a will, um, it will be necessary to go through the probate court to have those assets distributed. Um, because even if you have a will, you have certainly at least set forth the individuals you'd like to receive the asset, but you also have to designate someone to be in charge, an executor. But even though you can name who you'd like to be the executor in your will, uh, the probate court says, well, the only person who can actually appoint someone else to deal with your assets when you die is a probate judge. So even though you've named a person as executor in your will, um, they can't do anything until they get appointed by a probate judge. So we have to go through the probate process to have the assets flow through the will and to the beneficiaries. If you don't have a will and you die intestate, the person in charge is called an administrator. They'll be appointed by the judge. So the judge will decide who that administrator will be. And again, the judge has to appoint them. So we have to go through, through probate. So when it really comes down to it, 
every asset that you possess has to flow under one of these four options. And so obviously, if you have a good estate plan in place, you'll be kind of ahead of the curve and you'll get to pick the options that you want. Um, you know, if I have an IRA account, I'm going to make sure that I name both a primary beneficiary and a secondary beneficiary. Um, and if I have, you know, bank accounts, maybe I make sure that, you know, my spouse and I or my child and I are both owners of the account. So that will pass to the surviving joint tenant. And if I have other assets and I don't care about going through probate, I probably at least want to have a will in place so I get to decide who gets these remaining assets. Or if I don't want my beneficiaries to have to go through probate, I'll create a trust and then I'll make sure I put assets into that trust so that upon my death, they will, they will flow through. Okay. So it's kind of interesting. It's Every asset has to fall under one of those four categories. Kyle and A, is everybody awake? And I, I can't see the faces. So I don't know if anyone's fallen asleep yet or if we, or if it's too exciting, is anybody grabbing for oxygen? We, we okay? No one's jumped off yet from, from what I can tell, Pat. Okay, all right. Well, we'll keep going then. So just a little more in detail on these, okay? Because um, we get to we get to these, uh, like when we have joint ownership, um, one of the things that's interesting is that there's actually two forms of joint ownership. There's what we call joint tenants and tenants in common. So when we have joint tenants, uh, that says, you know, person A and person B own these assets together, and there's a right of survivorship, meaning that when one of us dies, uh, the other automatically becomes the 100% owner. So my wife and I have our checking account as joint tenants. That says if one of us dies, the other becomes the owner automatically. Don't have to file anything, do anything. Pretty simple. But there's also a joint ownership called tenants in common. So tenants in common still has two owners, but there's no right of survivorship. So if it says if one of us dies, their interest flows through to their estate and passes to the beneficiaries named in their trust or their will or whatever they have, it's not going to go to the surviving owner. And that's a big difference. The key that when we live in Illinois, every state is going to have its own default set of rules that says, hey, if you have two names on an asset and you don't declare if it's joint tenancy or tenants in common, we're going to say by default what it is. Illinois is a tenants in common state. So if the deed to the house says Pat and Jenny, you know, we deed the house to Pat and Jenny. That's all it says. It doesn't give us any other clues. Illinois is going to say Pat and Jenny, who's my wife, by the way, don't, don't think she's my girlfriend and get me in trouble. Um, the Pat and Jenny owners and tenants in common. So if one of us dies, our interest is not going to go to the other spouse. It's going to go to the estate. So Illinois says, if you're going to have it as joint tenants, you have to have some additional wording behind it. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see the initials joint tenants with rights of survivorship. So the account will say Pat and Jenny, J-T-W-R-O-S. Or if we say, um, you know, as joint tenants, that, that would be a good one. Or with rights of survivorship. I can't type all that out with my little mouse here, but rights of survivorship, um, or if it says um, Pat or Jenny, um, you know, in a car title, you'll see it a lot of times. Um, you know, if it says Pat and Jenny, ooh, that starts to look like tenants in common. And I don't mean to belabor this too much, but I can't tell you how many times this has caused huge issues in, in estate plans. Um, you know, husband dies, the, the, you know, at closing, they bought this house. And it's funny, when you buy a house, it's the it's the seller's attorney that prepares the deed. You don't prepare the deed. You don't really get a stand. So the seller prepares the deed and says, uh, we grant this house to Pat and Jenny. And comes to Pat and Jenny, we own the house, we're doing great, and I die. Uh, and now my wife, Jenny, assumes, hey, I'm the spouse, I'm the joint tenant. And we look at the deed and it says, no, uh, it, it didn't say as rights of survivorship or joint tenants or any of those things that would make it joint tenancy. So Pat's half interest now has to go to his estate. Well, I don't have a will. I don't have anything in place. 
Well, then we go through probate. And probate says, if you don't have a will, half of your assets go to your spouse and half of your assets go to your kids. Well, my kids are three and five years old. Yep. Well, they now own half of your half. They own a quarter of the house. <laughs> and since they're minors, now we're going to have to open up a guardianship estate. We have to have a court appointed guardian separate from the wife, even though she's there. And if you ever sell the house, you know, 25% of the proceeds are going to go to the kids. I mean, it's, it's just a nightmare. Um, so you always want to check that. You know, if there's two names on the account as Illinois, make sure there's something behind that your names that indicates that this is joint tenancy or with rights of survivorship or JWRS. But um, that is that is a huge, huge estate planning mistake we see a lot, and clients had no clue it was titled that way. We had a question come in, Pat. Um, <clears throat> kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. Uh, if I have a will, does it create a problem if my named executor is out of state? Um, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there'd been a problem because they, they, Illinois had, you had to be a resident that was abolished uh, at least 40 years ago. So no, you no longer have to be a resident to be an executor. That's absolutely fine. Okay. Good. I, have, I have a question on that joint ownership. Um, a question would be if, um, the adult children are on mom and dad's bank account, you know, to help them write checks, you know, versus a signer or a owner, joint owner. Can you talk through what may be best practice if they want to be an owner, say two kids want to be on mom's checking account to help her with her affairs? <laughs> Slide so three. I, I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> oh, that's good. You know, that's, that's, I can't tell how many hears it. You know, I'm on mom's check. I'm on their account. On is not a descriptive word. You're either a joint owner on the account or you're an authorized signer. So if I'm an authorized signer on my mom's checking account, I'm not an owner, but I have the ability to sign checks and, and you know, deal with her checking account. But that authority die or that authority ends when she dies. So once the account owner dies, authorized signers have no ability to sign checks anymore. So now I can't pay the funeral bill. Now we've got to go through the administrative process to see who gets that checking account. If I'm a joint owner of the account and mom and I own it as joint tenants, my name's on the statement, my name's on the check. Um, now if mom dies, I am the, so this is always said joint tenancy, you know, right of survivorship. Now I am still the owner of the account when mom dies. I can continue to write checks, pay bills. So again, that's another trap. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many people that say, well, I'm on account. Who on account? Are, are you an authorized signer or a joint owner? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, I'm on the account. Well, you gotta be, so you need to go check that because, um, you know, we've had a lot of times when they were actually just an authorized signer, mom dies and they want to start paying bills and expenses and they can't because the bank will no longer accept their signature. Uh, they want someone who now has legal authority to sign on behalf of mom. So we're going through probate or something to, to get an owner on there. Um, so that's, that's, uh, um, that's a pretty big difference. Uh, mm -hmm. So Pat, best practices potentially, and I apologize if this is too specific, would be say there's multiple siblings, right? Four kids, mom's mm -hmm. alive. Maybe one would be an authorized signer and then all four could potentially be POD beneficiaries. Yeah, so I mean, that gets through, you know, the best thing is, is you go back 10, 15 years ago, you didn't used to be able to name beneficiaries on bank accounts. So oh, my checking account, you can, but you know, today, every bank, they usually call it payable on death, POD. Sometimes they call it transfer on death, TOD. It's just, it's the same thing, just different, just different initials. Um, but you can now name a beneficiary to any bank account, checking, saving, CD, whatever, and usually that's going to probably be a better tool because if I have four kids and, you know, for convenience, I put child A, I make him a joint owner on the account with me so he can pay bills and stuff. Well, legally, when I die, that account passes to child A, not to B or C or D. Now, maybe child A is a very high moral person and say, yeah, I'll, I'll use this to pay debts and expenses and then I'll, you know, share the rest. Um you know, until one of the sub siblings says something to piss him off. And he's like, yeah, you know, the attorney said, this is actually really my account. I don't know where you guys are going to pay mom's bills and expenses, but <laughs> this account is mine now. Um, that That's a real issue. I mean, we all know 
mom didn't set that up to, to pass to the one child at the exclusion of the other three. But if he's the joint owner, it's his account. So yeah, if, if you said, well, I just want to have child A be able to help me pay bills, I'm going to make him an authorized signer. But then I'm going to name all four kids as the payable on death beneficiary. And then upon death, it, it flows to all four kids. And, and it's how mom wanted it. Um, so, you know, it's fairly easy to do as long as you're aware of, <laughs> you know, what a joint owner, what an authorized signer, you know, a, a beneficiary, just knowing what the tools are and making sure you set it up the correct way. Great. Thanks, Pat. Okay. Um, along that line, because we're kind of still sitting here on uh, um, with, with, with beneficiary designations, um, you know, it's kind of like we're talking here, setting up, you know, a payable on death or transfer on death. That's become pretty popular because we didn't, again, we didn't used to have that tool. I mean, IRAs and life insurance policies and retirement accounts always let you set up beneficiaries, but that was kind of it. Um, but now you can name beneficiaries to pretty much any account. So a lot of people are saying, well, why should I really even go through the effort of creating a will or a trust? I'll just make my four kids the beneficiaries on everything. And then when I die, it, it passes right to them. I didn't have to pay to have a will done or a trust done. There's actually no cost at all. And boom, pretty, pretty sweet deal. So one of the things to realize is that when you have um, uh, either a, you know, a, a will or a trust that says, okay, uh, I'm going to have a, a will or trust in place that says, when I die, um, you know, here's where I want my assets to be distributed. Uh, one of the things that they do first is whenever I have an asset that flows into a will or a trust is number one, I've directed who's going to be in charge. You know, I'm going to name an executor if it's a will or a trustee if it's a trust. I want you to be in charge. And your number one direction when I die is you must use this money to pay my bills and expenses uh, because the law is very clear that debts and expenses have to be paid before beneficiaries. And then whatever's left over after you pay the bills and expenses, you know, then distribute to my kids or the attorney I like or, you know, whatever you come up with there. Um, so it's kind of a good process named who's in charge, told them to pay bills and expenses, then distribute when it's done. When we look at beneficiary designations, if I have assets that have beneficiaries, and now I've got, you know, my four kids down here, uh, yes, when I die, they are instantly going to pay those assets to the four kids. Um, so, Zoom comes down and goes four ways. Zoom comes down and goes four ways. Well, now there's a knock at the door and it's the funeral home. The funeral home says, hey, um, we <laughs> we need 12 grand for the funeral. Um, <laughs> what do we do here? Well, first of all, none of us four kids is named in charge. So we're all looking at each other going, are, are you in charge? I'm not. You I'm not. And finally, one kid steps up. Okay, fine. I'll kind of be in charge. All right. Each of you give me $3,000 from your share and I'll you know pay the funeral home. Well, this guy here knew mom was feeling bad about a week or two before she died he had visited the car dealerships, you know, for, already had the truck on layaway. And uh, the second mom died and that account hit his, that money hit his account. He had the new truck bought and that's where his money went. He says, hey, but you three still have your money. I'm sure go ahead and use that and pay mom's funeral bills. Oh, no, no, you, you got to pay your share too. And well, I don't know, it wasn't my funeral. I don't think I should have to pay. Um, so you know, that that has become a huge issue. And now you see creditors filing lawsuits because, you know, then it, once that money hits my hand, it looks pretty good there. It's in my account. I really don't want to give it away. But the creditors have to get paid first. So they'll start suing the beneficiaries to force them to give some of that money back. So it's never a nice thing to give all the money away and then start asking to get the money back. Um, the other thing that a will or a trust is going to do is it's always going to have a contingency plan. You know, if the beneficiary I named is not living when I die, then I want that share to go to, 
you know, their children or some other beneficiary or charity or whatever you come up with, but you get to make a contingency plan. You know, I want this to pass to my kids in equal shares, but if one of my kids isn't living, I want their share to go to their kids. And if they don't have kids, blah, blah, blah. well, when you have beneficiary designations, you really don't get to set up the contingency plan. Um, you know, at that point, you're kind of at the mercy of the uh, the custodial agreement of the in, of the investment institution. Um, so, you know, if I have a account somewhere and says, okay, I named A and B as beneficiaries, but upon my death, A isn't alive. Well, where does their share go? Well, we have to look to the custodial agreement, which is the rules of the account. And every bank and investment firm has their own custodial agreement, own rules. And they're all pretty much different, you know, I just took a random sample here, you know, American funds, Fidelity, American T. Okay. So American fund says, oh, well, if the person is not living, we're going to give their share to their spouse. And if they don't have any spouse, we're going to give it to their kids. Fidelity give it to the spouse, but if not the spouse, then then the estate. Wells Fargo says, uh, we're only going to get to the living beneficiaries, the one who died out of luck. Um you know, a lot of the banks and stuff go right to the estate. Hey, if there's not a beneficiary living, we want you to open a probate estate and go to court because we don't want to have to get sued by anybody. So we want a judge to figure this out. So, you know, this can become a huge pain in the butt and we incur legal fees and stuff. So those are the two kind of, you know, wobbly cards of, of relying your whole estate plan on beneficiary designations. Um, you don't have money coming into a central repository that you've directed someone to be in charge and pay bills and expenses. And you don't necessarily have control over the contingency plan. You're kind of at the mercy of the um, of, of the, uh, the the company where the assets are at. Um, so if you have a will or a trust, you're taking back control of all of those things. So to me, I look at a beneficiary designation as a nice tool. I don't know that I would necessarily rely on that to be my estate plan. Unless I was a, you know, 95 year old, you know, mom, I just have a, a checking account and a savings account. I have two kids. I name them as the payable and death beneficiaries. Hopefully they'll both get along. If I have one kid, it's really easy. Now they'll pay the bills and expenses. But once you start getting more than just a bank account and stuff, that, that can, that house of cards can fall pretty, pretty quickly. Um, where the payable on death can be nice is like we said, when you have a trust, um, you either have to retitle the account in the name of the trust to allow to avoid probate, or you could leave the account in your name and just make your trust the beneficiary. So for example, if I had a, I just created a trust, I didn't want to go through probate, so I've created this revocable trust. And now the attorney says, I got to title my assets into my trust. So I go to the bank and say, hey, I guess I got to title my checking account, you know, into the Pat Agnew Trust. I said, oh, we, we do that a whole bunch. No problem. Um, you are going to have to order all new checks because they got to say Pat Agnew Trust on them. Uh, we're probably going to sign you a new account number. We have a whole stack of paper you need to sign because this is like opening a new account. And because we're giving you a new account number, if you had anything coming into your account automatically, good luck changing all of that. You're like, oh, no, this is just a nightmare. I don't do that. So instead we say, no, no. Please just name the check, it, leave it in my name, just as is, but I'm going to name my trust as the beneficiary. And then upon my death, that checking account flows right into the trust, no probate. It's there for my executive pay bills, but I didn't have to go through any big changes during my lifetime. So that's where I see the beneficiary, some of you, a little more helpful is having it go like into a trust. Yeah. Nate. Pat, Pat, would there be any downside to doing it that way? Because I hear you, that is a, a roadblock for some clients, you know, dealing with multiple institutions. Is there any drawback to having it just pay to the trust as a beneficiary as opposed to ownership? Nope. Nope. Okay. As long as the asset is in the trust at death. So whether you title it in there while you're alive or it flowed in by beneficiary upon death, both work equally as well. And, and with the advent of more beneficiary designation options, I'm seeing that being used more commonly, you know, even like with you guys, they have an investment account, you can certainly change the name of the trust, but I got to suspect it's easier just to leave the account as is and name the trust as the beneficiary. It is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when it's a really nice tool. Very good. Good to know. Everybody good so far? Anything someone wants me to talk about? Nope. We're good so far. Okay. 
So one of the things I kind of want to touch on is, is so looking at instructions. So that, that was kind of how assets flow, right? So we got to have, you know, have a structure in place, your estate plan. So you've kind of taken control of the assets are going to flow either not going through pay, probate or through probate, whatever my wish is, and it's going to the beneficiaries I want. So the other part of that is saying, okay, once, once I have an asset, um, you know, and I've identified a beneficiary. There's kind of two things. You can give somebody the asset, you know, give them the money. I'm going to name, you know, Bob is the beneficiary and he gets this money outright when I die. Or you can give them the use of the money. So you could put instructions that says, I'm going to leave instructions that a trust will be created when I die. And I want the money to go into that trust for the benefit of this beneficiary. So I'm going to set forth instructions that determine how and when they can receive assets from that trust. So I'm giving them the use of the money. But if they happen to die before they've received all the money, again, my trust is going to have a contingency plan that says, well, you know, now I want the remaining balance to go, you know, to these individuals or, or whatever happens. But um, so I might set up the trust to say, I would like this beneficiary to receive a monthly payment for life. I don't want to give them this huge check. You know, it would be really helpful to them as getting a $500 check every month for the rest of their life. And then when they die, you know, I want the remaining balance to go to these two people. So now I gave Bob the use of the money, but the actual money, you know, went elsewhere. And so there's a lot of reasons that you might have money go into a trust instead of going to, uh, the beneficiary directly. Um, you know, probably the most common one is, okay, well, I've got a minor child or a minor grandchild. You know, my child's 10 years old. I can't give them $200,000 for a whole list of reasons. So I would like it to go into a trust and I want the money to be used in that trust to pay their basic necessities. If they need money for food and clothing and shelter and their education, you know, I'll name a trustee to oversee that. And I'll give that person authority to determine, you know, when money should be paid out. And then once that child reaches a threshold age, you know, once they're, you know, 30 years old, you know, then the trust can end and they can have the balance. But, you know, there's a lot of, you can shape those instructions any way you want. Uh, another common example is if I might have a disabled beneficiary. I've got a child or a grandchild who's disabled and they're on government assistance. And if I die and I leave them $50,000, that's going to ruin their eligibility for whatever assistance programs are on. And now they're going to have to self-pay and spend that down and then reapply. And I'm going to cause them a whole nightmare. So I'm going to create what they typically call a supplemental needs trust. So I want the money to go into this trust and I'm going to name a trustee and I'm going to say, you have the discretion to use that money at the benefit of the disabled beneficiaries for whatever needs they have. Um, now, my only catch is I don't want you to pay that money directly to the beneficiary because if you put money in their bank account, again, it looks like they just got money and it might ruin their eligibility. So if they need a new TV in their room, don't put $1,500 in a checking account. Go to Best Buy, buy the TV, plunk the TV in their room. And, and Illinois has a very clear law that says as long as the beneficiary can't demand the money, it can only be paid out at the discretion of the trustee that you put in charge, and we don't give them the money directly, it will not impact their eligibility for any financial needs-based programs, regardless of how much is in that trust. I mean, that trust can hold a million dollars and still not affect their eligibility. Um, another common example is... Uh, <clears throat> You know, my first marriage didn't work out so well. She saw through me, so I was an idiot, divorced me. So now I've got married again, um, but I've got kids from my first marriage. I certainly want to provide for my surviving, my new spouse if she survives me. My fear is if I just give her the money when I die, you know, when she subsequently dies, she might have that all go to her kids from her first marriage, and now my kids don't get anything. So I'm going to put money into a trust for her and I'm going to direct that she gets a monthly payment for life, you know, either the income that the assets generate or two or 3% of the trust balance. 
I may also give her some access to the principal. You know, if you needed principal for medical care, medical procedures, you know, I want it used for that. Uh, if I own the house, may I put the house in that trust too and say you get lifetime use of the house. But when my second spouse, my new spouse subsequently dies, you know, then I want any remaining balance to go to my children or may split between our common children or whatever I come up with. But again, I'm giving my spouse the use of the money without giving them the money. Um, and then the last one we see that's just, just really popular is, is, you know, common marriage. I have common kids. My kids are, you know, 20, 30 years old. Um, they're going to get, you know, $800,000 each. Um, I'm pretty confident in my kids' fiscal ability to get $800,000 each. One I'm not real comfortable with, however, is, you know, one of them gets married the year after I die. And then six months after that, the spouse says, yeah, this is not working out for me. I'd like a divorce. Oh, uh, that $800,000 you inherited the year before we got married. Um, yeah, half of that's going to be coming with me out of the divorce. Uh, you know, I bumped a school bus on my way to work. Somebody slipped in my house in the party I had last night. I mean, there's a million things you can get sued for in the world we're living in today. And so from a, um, you know, from a liability perspective, um, there's a huge wall. You know, if I have a trust created for a beneficiary versus giving the money to them directly, um, there is a big wall right here so that if the beneficiary gets sued, they can only come after money that the beneficiary owns. They can't come after money that's sitting in a trust that someone other than the beneficiary, me, the dad, created. So when you put money into a trust like this, this is kind of like a little safe, a little vault. It says, well, I'm going to give my child the access to these funds but while they're in there, they can't be taken away from my child under any circumstance. Bankruptcy, nursing home, car accident, lawsuit, divorce, doesn't matter. That money is totally protected. That has a lot of appeal to parents today. Again, I may trust my child implicitly to handle $800,000, but the rest of the world, who knows? So I would really like to provide them with this asset protection. And I think a lot of times people look at trusts as being traditionally a very restrictive kind of, you know, deal, um, but they don't have to be. Um, you can set up a trust to be very flexible. So we're setting this up for kids, pretty common to say, well, first of all, right off the bat, I want my child to start getting maybe a monthly check from this. Um, typically, you would do that by fixing a percentage, like 3%. So we'd say, okay, January 1st of each year, we're going to multiply the balance of your trust by 3%. So again, if there was $800,000 in there, we multiply that by 3%. That's $24,000. That's the amount I want paid out this year. So we're going to divide 24,000 by 12, and that's going to be a $2,000 check that goes into their account first day of each month. And, you know, the ironic thing is they may blow the first couple of checks, but I don't care who the beneficiary is. By the third or fourth month, they're going, hey, that $2,000 check showing up the same time my mortgage payment's due and my car payment's due. I've got some utility bills. Hey, I could use that. to." So the fact that it comes frequently on a monthly basis and not in this huge five or six figure lottery winning time check, but something very digestible that's really that's really beneficial. In addition to that, you can say, oh, and I'm also going to give you access to the principal and you list out the things they need. You know, if you need money for the education of your children, my grandchildren, if you need money down payment to buy a house or a vacation property, if you're getting a business or if I want you to be able to buy a car or take your family on vacations or you make the list, you know, however long you want, and basically, then when that need arises, they can pull the money out as the need is there. But if they don't need to spend the money, they can leave it back inside this trust where it is totally protected and can't take take away from them. And at some point, you'll say, you know, ultimately, I want you to, you know, the trust will end and you have your money. You know, maybe, maybe begin at age 50, we'll distribute out the balance over the next 10 years, just, you know, monthly payments. These will be pretty larger payments now instead of four or five, you might be getting 10 or 12,000 a month. 
And again, if my child dies before they get that share, I'm probably going to say, well, if they have kids of their own, my grandkids, uh, I want their share split up into trust for their kids to be held under the same rules that I set up trust for my child. Um, so, um, you know, showing a lot of different types of trusts here. And when you think about it, we always start every trust with a blank page. You know, here's what the instructions are going to be. I can make this a very restrictive trust. I can make this a very broad trust. I can do it for a minor child, disabled child, a spouse, an adult child. Um, but there's a lot of power in this tool. And I think a lot of times people aren't aware of it. They just kind of, oh, yeah, I got adult kids. So we're just giving them each, you know, give their share outright. Um, but you can help them out a lot, I think, by giving them not only the cash, but a nice golden box that's protected from creditors <laughs> with the cash in it. To me, that's part of the gift is the asset protection I'm putting around that for you. Um, so that's that's a that's a I think a point a lot of people aren't aware that they have all these options and it kind of opens their eyes going, wow, I didn't know I could do that. And you know, I always thought about, you know, what happens if, you know, I don't want Bubba coming in and getting, you know, my daughter's share of the estate. How do we stop that? Well, that that's how you do it. Kind of makes sense? Sort of kinda. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's a I think it's a good I love this sheet here, Pat, where you kind of break it down because we as advisors, you know, in a perfect world, all of our clients would probably have a trust, but the reality is not everybody needs one. Um, but these are always red flags for us of advisors. If you have maybe a child has substance abuse or you have a special needs or blended families, those are almost always a trust is probably going to be the best way to go anytime you're dealing with one of those situations. So yeah, and it's amazing how that can solve. You know, I I I know I wanted to do something, but I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. Oh, that was exactly it. It, it just oh, I'm I feel so much better now. I can have my estate plan do just what I wanted it to do. Yeah. So Pat, maybe you can talk a little bit about the federal estate tax and how that's changed over years, because that's always a big one. I mean, we had they were you know trusts probably aren't quite as common now as they were. 30 years ago when the estate tax limits were a lot different too. So. <laughs> so when we talk about an estate tax, the, the better word would be it's a transfer tax. So the general rule is whenever you give money to somebody else, um, the IRS is going to charge you, the person who gave the money with the tax. And if you're alive, we call it an estate tax. Uh, if you're, I'm sorry, if you're dead, we call it an estate tax. If you're alive, when you give it away, it's called a gift tax. It's the same tax, the same rates. The IRS could care lesser if you're alive or you're dead. Whenever you give stuff away, you have to pay the tax. So the beneficiary does not pay any tax on, on, on gifts to them. So if you ever get a chance to sign up for beneficiary, do it. It's a good deal. You get the money and there's no estate tax on it. So the the you know this has changed quite a bit over time so if we go back to the 1980s and all the way up to 2000 the deal used to be that the IRS said hey we will allow you during your life or upon death or any combination thereof you can pass up to $600,000 of assets on the house but if you give away more than 600,000 we'll tax you on that excess and the tax will be you know 45 to 50% it is a large estate tax. And then when Clinton was in office, he got it up to a million dollars for the free pass. And then Bush came into office and he got it up to three and a half million dollars free pass. Obama came into office and he got it up to five million dollars. And then Trump got into office and he's got it presently up to just shy of 13 million. It's 12 million 920, but we'll say 13. Um, and now anything above that, the tax rate is 40%, not, not 50 anymore. It's still the highest tax we have. Um, and while you may give some things away while you're alive, you know, upon death, involuntarily, you're going to give every asset you acquire to somebody. And so the estate tax is usually going to be the big tax because the IRS doesn't care to how many or who you give it to fact that you gave it the taxes on you. So with with you know the laws that Trump have put in place, 
there are not many people that have estates more than $13 million. I mean, it's, you know, probably less than 1% of the country. So for years now, that the estate tax conversation kind of went away. When it was $600,000, well, yeah, between my IRA and a house and life, a lot of people could, could reach that level. During this period of time, the federal government, and this is all IRS, this is all federal taxes, the IRS used to give a little kickback to the state that the person was a resident of. And when Bush was in office in here, he said, hey, let me get this straight. So we pass the tax laws, we collect the tax, we do all the work, and then we give some back to the state. Mm, yeah, we're done with that. We're cutting that off right now. So states, if you want to collect estate taxes from your citizens, pass your own darn laws. Well, Illinois said that is a phenomenal idea. So Illinois passed their own state estate tax. Uh, but, you know, not to make things simple, they set the Illinois limit at $4 million. And once you get above that, it's about a 20% tax. It's a lower um, tax. So, you know, if I'm a Wisconsin resident, I don't have any state tax, state estate tax. So as long as my estate's under 13 million, I'm good. If I'm an Illinois resident and I had a $5 million estate, um, ooh, uh, I'm a million dollars over 20%. You know, I'm going to have a, you know, whatever this $200,000 tax bill. Um, so that, that's been a little bit of a game checker. It's still, you got to, you know, there's not a ton of people that have estates over 4 million. Um, so, you know, that's, that's for a single person too. Okay. If you're married, husband and wife each possess one of those amounts. So if you were in Illinois as a couple, you say, well, I have 4 million. My spouse is 4 million. We're, we're at 8 million. So we're good up to 8 million. Well, it, it doesn't quite work that way because one of the biggest exceptions for estate taxes is in places for spouses. And there's what's called an unlimited marital, marital deduction that says, as long as you're married, you two can give unlimited amounts to each other during life or at death and we will never assess any gift or estate tax. So most wills or trusts say, hey, when I die, give it all to my spouse if living, otherwise to the kids. So on the first death, that assures us there will never be, I could have a $20 million estate, no estate taxes, which, which that's good. So that no depletion for the surviving spouse. But I don't, they didn't assess any tax. So I have nothing to use my $4 million pass against. I throw it away. I just gave my spouse the whole 20 million. And now when they die, they can only shelter the first 4 million from Illinois and the first 13 million from federal. So they're gonna be paying a lot of estate taxes. So if you want to use both of your exemptions, you have to take specific steps in your documents. So my will or trust would say, if I'm the first spouse to die, don't give it to my surviving spouse. Keep it in a trust under my name let the state of Illinois and the IRS estate tax it. I'm going to use my $4 million free pass and offset it. I'll give my spouse whatever access they want for life. But when they die, whatever's still left will flow to the kids under my exemption. And my spouse then uses his or her exemption to, to cover the other. So bottom line is if you're Illinois residents, you're under $4 million, don't have to worry about estate taxes. If as Illinois residents as a couple, you're over four million. You could you could raise the bar to eight million if you did you know correct planning in your documents, but you'd have to take steps to do that. If you're a Wisconsin resident, you don't have a state of state tax in Wisconsin. You know you're looking at thirteen million. And the last comment I have here is the federal the IRS has what they call portability uh, that Bush introduced that says hey if you're married and your spouse dies, and they don't use all of their full exemption, their federal exemption, you can file a gift tax return and elect to take their exemption and apply it to yours. So if my will says I give it all to my, my, my Wisconsin will says I give everything to my Wisconsin spouse when I die, no estate tax. So my spouse files an estate tax return, takes my 13 million and adds it to hers. She now has a $26 million exemption when she dies. 
which if she's smart, she'll move to Florida because you're very attractive when you're Florida and you have a $26 million exemption. <laughs> so use that wisely. <laughs> Illinois does not have the portability. So if you don't set it aside at the first death, you lose it. It's gone. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that clarification. I know that's a question we get sometimes is people hear that 50% tax number and they think they're automatically going to give that away once they pass on yeah. money. So, <laughs> but well, good. Well, we're getting to the end of the hour here. So um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and enter it in the Q&A in the chat and we'll keep patting around for a little bit longer. <clears throat> um, and then we will go from there. Anything else you wanted to cover up front here, Pat? I think you did a really good job of just kind of the difference between wills and trusts and what makes sense for each person and their situation and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I didn't go into a lot between the wills and trusts, but I mean, the, you know, probably the number one misconception with estate planning is that, oh, because I took the time to do a will, um, I don't have to go through probate. That's very common. But again, the, the, the key with a will is that you can designate the person you would like to be executor. You know, I want Bob to be the executor of my estate, but naming him in your will does not make him an executor. He only assumes that role when he gets appointed by a probate judge. So he must hire a law firm, file papers with the court, open a probate estate, and at the first court hearing, the judge will knight him and give him a court order that says, by authority of the court, Bob, you are now executor and you can sign your name on the decedent's things. Um, with trusts, they're not governed by the Probate Act. So here I can say, I want Bob to be the trustee. And in my trust instructions, I set forth ahead of time, when I, can, when I die and the next trustee steps up, here are all the powers I want them to have. The ability to write checks, pay bills, set up trusts, make investments. And whatever powers I included here, Bob just automatically assumes and starts acting. He doesn't have to go through the probate court to get that permission. So that's really what it comes down to is, is um, an executor, when you're just named them in their will, they're Clark Kent. They got no powers. If they want the red cape and the red boots, they got to go down to the probate court to get that. Um, but with the trust, I can name who I want to be in charge. And I can give them ahead of time all the legal power I want them to have. And the time my death, off they go. You know, and I think the big thing we want everybody to hear is that um, if you don't have a plan, the state has a plan for you. And that's not necessarily going to be what you want. <laughs> so yeah. at a bare minimum, we would, you know, want everybody to at least get a will and powers of attorney set up. Um, yeah, but we'll put you miles ahead of having nothing. Yeah, exactly right. And this stuff is obviously so individual based on your situation and what you want to accomplish with everything. So it's well worth sitting down with an attorney to walk through all your different options with this. But this is designed just to kind of get you thinking about those types of things and common pitfalls because, you know, that's the and if you have a will and you set it up 30 years ago, it probably needs to blow the dust off of it and look at it again because you probably have more kids or more grandkids that you didn't have 30 years ago and all kinds of things as well. So well, you don't want your 40 five-year-old child have to go live with your sister because you're dark. <laughs> <laughs> <That's awkward. laughs> you know, Pat, I have a question on, <clears throat> and I'm sorry for running out of time, on the um, um, gifting to the next generation to quote unquote, you know, protect it from the nursing home, right? Can you talk about like, you know, gifting during life to protect assets from a spend down and things like that and pitfalls or best practices with that? And I realize that's a big topic too, so... Well, but just quickly, when, when if you ever have to go to a nursing home uh, and you want to apply for Medicaid, so the state will pay for you, they're basically going to ask you three questions. Um, so the very first question they're going to say is, hey, did you have some money, um, but you gave it away recently? Um, or do you just have, you know, do you have any money? They say, well, yeah, I, I do. What do you mean by money? Well, do you have more than $4,000? Uh, yes, I do. Oh, well, you're too wealthy for this program. You need to spend your assets down to roughly $4,000. There's some exclusions, but so you come back the next day and go, hey, do you have any money? Uh, nope, I don't. Uh, hey, did you give any money away recently? Well, uh, yeah, I, I gave the money to my child yesterday so I could honestly answer your question that I didn't own the assets. So you say, okay, so let me get this straight. You 
You did have money. You could have paid for your own care, but instead you elected to give it to your son, and now you're asking the citizens of the state to pay for your care for you. Well, that's not how I would have phrased it exactly, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, kind of. So we think that's a bad thing. So, you know, we can't undo this, all right? We can't make them give the money back. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the daily cost of nursing home care where you're at. Um, and, you know, if you could have purchased, you know, 60 days of nursing home care with the money you gave away, we'll start paying for you, but we're not going to start paying for you until 60 days from now. And so from today until that point, you're on your own. Hopefully you can get some of that money back and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, um, you know, you can help take care of you. So you come back the next day. Um, I guess I kind of gave the second question away. The first question was, do you have any money? The second question was, did you have money and you gave it away recently? But then the recently, well, what do you mean by recently? Well, over the last 15 years, this the Medicaid rules have really mm. tightened down a lot. It used to be within the last year. And then they branch it out to the last three years. And now currently, the what they call the look back period is five years. So in the last five years, did you give any money to a family member or somebody? Um, and if you have, again, they'll look at what how many days of care that money could have purchased. And that's how long they'll stretch that out. Well, you know, and during this process, though, especially when it was one year and stuff, that was a pretty popular concept. Yeah, let's give some money to the kids now, get it out of my name. When the one year goes by, if I apply for Medicaid, I'm good. I've got extra money with the kids. If I need some things, Medicaid can't cover. They've got extra money to do it. Well, now when it gets to five years, I mean, that, that you got to be thinking about that a long time. But then funny things happen along the way. I put gave that money to my child, and then a year later they got divorced. And in the divorce because it was in their his name, he lost half of it, or he you know he went and bought the new truck, or geez, mom, I didn't think you were gonna really need that money. I thought you were giving it to me. I, I spent it. I don't. I can't help you out anymore. So then they started to say, well, maybe what I should do is instead of giving it to my child, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to a trust. We'll create this Medicaid trust. Now, in honest, for me to say I don't own it, the trust has to be irrevocable. So once I once I create the trust, I can never change it. Um, when you do a revocable trust as your estate planning document, you usually name yourself as the trustee. Um, but if I'm going to say that I don't have any ownership interest in this, um, I can't name myself as the trustee. So I'm going to have to name my child or somebody else to be the trustee over this. And then finally, we look at, well, what can come out of a trust? Well, a trust, you can get the income that the assets generate, and then you can also pay out the actual assets themselves, what we call the principal. And so this became a pretty common tool. We'd set up an irrevocable trust, put my child in charge. It says the income comes to me. And if they, if the, at the child's discretion, they can give me principal for anything that Medicaid isn't covering. And once I've gotten past the look back period, we're golden. Well, again, Medicaid started looking at these and said, okay, so let me get this straight. You're telling me you don't own this trust, but you funded it with your money. Um, you get the income from it. And technically the trustee could actually give you all the principal back under these instructions. Well, again, that's not how I would explain it, but I guess technically, I suppose you're right. And they said, yeah, we don't think you've really given anything away. So if you don't want this to affect your eligibility, we're going to make you cut out the principal. You can only have the income that the assets generate unless you add in a payback clause that says when you die, before any money passed to the beneficiary, you have to pay back the state of Illinois for any Medicaid you, you've done in there. Well, that made it much less attractive because, you know, now if I put $100,000 in here, maybe getting a little better now, but for the past three or four years, what, what could you invest cash in to get income? Well, you know, CDs were at, you know, a half a percent or 1%. Um, you know, I wasn't getting much at all. And I gave up my right to ever access that $100,000. It might be a little better today with interest rates going up, but bottom line is, we used to crank those out by the truckload when you could have a lot of access. Now that you can't, you can only have the income. It's a lot to give up. Um, and again, that's just Medicaid kind of 
tightening up the rules and the loopholes because there's more people needing the money than they have funding. So they've got to tighten that up. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess the very last thing is that it used to be, you know, if we had a married couple and we'd say, okay, if one of us looks like they're going to go into a nursing home, we will have this spouse transfer all the assets to the healthy spouse. Again, we have that look back period, but then once the look back period is done, this spouse can apply for a nursing home. That was one of our best tools. Uh, and then about six or seven years ago, Illinois changed that and said, yeah, if one spouse applies for nursing home care, we're looking at your combined assets to see if they're, they have more than the $4,000 that are eligible. So that that was a huge tool that we lost that used to be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty commonplace. So they made it tough. Yeah. We had another question coming, Pat. <clears throat> um, cost and timeline to get all this set up, and then what are some documents, answers I need to have a productive first meeting? I'll take part of the first cost one. Um, there are attorneys that will charge you way too much for some of this stuff, and they like to put on seminars and give you a free dinner and all kinds of stuff to, to get those set up. Uh, so be careful with the attorneys that you use. You want to focus on somebody that... Um, has estate planning as one of their main focuses. A lot of attorneys say they'll, say they'll do estate planning, um, but they may not be very good at it. And they may not know how to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. But um, what about cost and timeline from your perspective, Pat? Um, well, you know, it's kind of hard to talk for everybody because everybody turns different. I think that, you know, if you have a will, is what I call the primary document. So with the will, and then you do you always want to do powers of attorney for property and powers of attorney for health care um, and maybe a HIPAA release. Um, so, you know, as a couple, you know, depending upon which law firm, you know, that might be anywhere from, you know, a thousand to three thousand dollars. Again, depending upon law firms and location, the closer you get to Lake Michigan, everything goes up in, in cost. Um, if you do a trust as the main project, that's always going to be a little more cost on the front end because you're going to have, we'll do the trust. We still do a small will that goes with the trust. They call it a pour over will to catch the things we didn't put in the trust and to distribute all the personal and household effects. Plus you do the poverty attorney for property and healthcare and the HIPAA release. But then we're also going to need to do a deed to the house. Um, we'd have to do asset retitling, uh, work with your office and, you know, get beneficiaries. Or, so there's, there's more, work on the front end to do that. Um, so, you know, there you might be looking at, you know, $2,500 to $5,000, again, depending upon the firm and, and, and the location. There's always going to be a higher cost to, to do a trust than a will project. But, you know, the benefit is you're going to save going through probate. And, um, Again, that that's very depending upon where you're at in the fees. But you know, I can tell you that most firms will have a minimum fee of five to six thousand um, dollars, you know, for going through probate. So if you can eliminate that by doing a trust, you know, the incremental difference you're saving. And that's I mean, most estates, you know, if you have a you know, typical estate, I'd say the average, you know, you're looking at ten to fifteen thousand dollars going through probate. And this is the minimum, the floor that most firms will will have. Um yeah. as far as timeline, um, you know, I think when like when we have an initial meeting, we will just send a, a little personal information that see just just says give us your names and your kids' names spelled correctly. So <laughs> we spell them correctly, and we just give a small financial sheet unless like they're with you guys and you can provide that, but it, it just helps know the types of assets that you have, you know, is there a house, a condo, another piece of property. So we know on retitling and what we have to do, but I mean, that's, you know, if it takes you more than 10 minutes to fill that out, cause, cause it's open book, you can use your driver's license to copy your name and stuff. <laughs> and then, you know, we'll have that meaning and we would outline, you know, well, here, here's how will works. Here's how trust works. Here's the difference. Do you want to set up trust for your kids? Here's different options. We'll go through all kinds of stuff. And at the end of the meeting, you know, there, there wouldn't be any obligation. We'd say, well, if you want to do the will project, you know, this would be the precise cost given what you want to do. If you want to do the trust project, this is the precise cost. And then we typically give a homework package. It says, you know, here are the decisions you need to decide. 
who's going to be the power of attorney, who's going to be the trustee. Now that you know what these jobs are, you can give us the names. And here's what here's the instructions that you'd like to have, whether it's going in, in trust for the kids or outright. You go home with that, and and that usually tends to be the longest part because sometimes you know life gets in the way, it goes on the pile. Two months goes by, it's like oh, we never filled that in, you know. That usually is the longest piece. Once we get that back, usually within around three weeks, we have the draft documents um, back to you. That that uh, we will do draft documents with nice little summaries on each document that say in you know ultra plain English, this is what this document does. Uh, and then once you've looked at those, then you come back in, we go through them, make any changes and then, and then sign them. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe typically two months, but, but a good portion of that is just waiting to get the information back from the client um, just because they got stuff going on and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. And like Pat said, we work with his uh, firm very closely. So if you are a client of ours and you decide to work with Pat, we can help speed up that process because obviously we have a lot of the different accounts and everything that Pat would need to be aware of. So we can certainly help speed that process up. Like I said, if you go that route. 